What does your group work on? So we're interested in three different areas, um, solar energy, in particular flexible uh, solar panels, uh, materials that go into those solar panels. We are interested in wearable and potentially implantable mechanical sensors for biology, uh, for human physiology and uh, rehabilitation. We have a uh, another project in that area on um, devices for measuring mechanical processes in cells. And uh, finally, the third area is haptics and human machine interfaces. So how do in particular materials, how can materials be designed to interface with the sense of touch and to learn about the sense of touch? Now, those three areas seem completely disconnected, but they are not. They are tied together by a core fundamental scientific problem, which is the structure function relationships in the ways in which organic materials have particular can be designed to exhibit particular electronic and especially mechanical function. So the particular area in organic or in solar cells that we're interested in is how to make these layers more mechanically robust, more flexible, more resilient. Uh, in our area, in our work in bioelectronics, we're interested in mechanical processes in cells. We're interested in mechanical sensors that all involve um, using these materials that we're making as the uh, as the um, the sort of the locus of sensing or actuation. And then finally, in haptics, we're interested in making these materials generate tactile sensations that you can't uh, that you can't generate from uh, uh, conventional actuators. How is your work funded? We have five federally funded projects, so three NS or two NSF projects, actually three NSF projects and one of them is a multi uh, a multi PI uh, center grant. We have a project from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. We have a project from the National Institutes of Health. Um, and uh, so I guess we have six because we have another one from the uh, California Energy Commission. And those are the major sources of support. The students tend to, the projects bleed into one another. Um, there is nobody in the lab who is working only on one thing. Um, everybody helps each other. Uh, the types of equipment that we use are common between the projects. So while the application areas are quite disparate, the methods turn out to be somewhat similar, at least on the material science aspect. Is there one project or grant you are especially excited about? We managed to get a grant with uh, Ardem Pataputian um, as a as a mentor who just won the Nobel Prize last October for uh, his group's discovery of the ion channels in the skin that contribute to the sense of of touch and fine texture. So yeah, our piece of the project is to build uh, devices that can apply small forces to mechanically responsive cells to learn about how they uh, behave in certain environments that are hard to, uh, to, let's say, observe naturally. How many students are in your group? Sure. Right now we have uh, seven PhD students. Uh, six undergraduates, and two postdocs. Is that typical? Yeah, that's pretty typical. Our high, high water mark, I believe, was, uh, was 11 grad students and two postdocs and 18 undergrads. Um, so that, uh, they weren't all there at the same time. So that was our, our high water mark in each category. Um, and but we've had as many as 25 people in the lab at any given time. How do you communicate with your lab members? The method of 
one-on-one -on -one communication that's typical between me and the grad students and postdocs is very similar. Undergraduates I meet with less often. So grad students, I have a, an individual meeting with them every four weeks. I have a subgroup meeting with them and a couple of close, uh, close collaborators of theirs every uh, every four weeks but they're staggered so i see progress on the project every two weeks and every quarter uh, there is a group meeting every week and one person uh, presents one to two people present their work of the last um, the last 10 or 11 weeks um, at the at at the group meeting and then at the end of that group meeting we have a round table where everybody gives a quick update of um, one to two minutes. The round table sounds like a great idea. Does that work well? Yeah, the, the purpose of that is to share best practices. I mean, it's it, what I don't want it to turn into is I better show Darren what I've been working on. So I'm gonna come up with a laundry list of stuff. So it sounds like I've been productive. What I want that meeting to be, or what that, that round table to be, is to say, oh, I'm having some issues with such and such an instrument or a technique, um, or I learned something about an instrument or technique that I wanna share with you. Um, we also have uh, the opportunity for, uh, for lab members to give shout outs uh, to uh, other group members um, if they were either you know helped in kind of a selfless way by that person or if they observed that person giving help selflessly to somebody else we used to give awards for shout outs at the end of each quarter um, but we stopped doing that because the same people ended up getting them um, every quarter. And it's not so much that those were necessarily the most selfless people, you know, helpers in the lab, but often they had group jobs that that affected everybody. So uh, so they, they might have, you know, constitutionally been the most helpful, but... <laughs> But it, but in reality, it's because they uh, they were in charge of a popular piece of equipment and came in on the weekend to fix it and stuff like that. How long have you been doing the shout outs? The shout out piece started in 2016. We had a grad student, Brandon Marin, who had spent time in, in industry and he's at Intel now. He has a phone book of, of patents under his, his name. Um, and he introduced the, the shout outs to the lab um, and, uh, and we, we've kept it ever since. How have shout outs and other cultural elements you have implemented influenced climate in your lab? I would, I would put our climate up against anybody's. Um, I think if I look at the labs that I've been a member of, I would rather be a member of my lab than, <laughs> than the labs I've, I've been a member of. Um, not, uh, not to take anything away from those places. They, they're fine places. They, uh, you know, were responsible for however, for, for my, uh, success such as it is, <laughs> but but I do think that things like this contribute to the, uh, the, the welcoming, open, and trusting climate that we have. How do you hire new lab members? When we hire a new person, a grad student or postdoc, we rock the Coke machine back and forth a lot. They meet with us... Um, individually uh, they have multiple meals with the current grad students um, we don't just I, I as a pi i don't just take somebody on and impose them on the group they need to be um, they need to to go through the uh, the the ringer <laughs> and make sure that you know that we don't hire any um, any jerks so it starts there. Um, you know, we start with a good 
with a good substrate of of people um and uh yeah what do you look for in new lab members when you are interviewing i look for curiosity above all i think that for for a grad student or a postdoc or an undergraduate for that matter they need to be coming into research for the right reasons um, and it's either because they're already curious about a topic and want to learn more or it's kind of like a meta curiosity they are curious about if research is for them but they really want to get into it and learn what it is to be a researcher before making that decision not just like i'm going to go to a couple group meetings and work three hours a week um, it's i want to really get in there really get dirty in the library <laughs> um, looking up old papers and uh, and learning obscure techniques and talking to my uh, my lab mates so curiosity is i think the number one thing um, it's actually hard to be um, yeah, I think it's I think that automatically drives out a lot of toxic personality types as well, because if somebody's gen genuinely curious about things about uh, research or the particular scientific topic that they're interested in, they actually have a lot less mental bandwidth to be consumed with um, with uh, being like alpha, you know, um, or, or, or being greedy about acquiring resources or attention. And I think that, that, that it, it kind of goes hand in hand with, with, um, you know, being curious kind of excludes a lot of that. Um, I also like people to be independent. Um, I am the associate dean for students in engineering um, as well. And I do not have the bandwidth to, um, to micromanage students' projects. Um, and even if I did, I probably wouldn't be the best person to do it because I haven't worked in, the, in a lab in more than 10 years. Um, and uh, and I, I really do, do need students to come to meetings with, with uh, their independently formulated ideas. I need them to be able to reach out to vendors and collaborators uh, and each other. Sometimes that can be a challenge for some individuals. Um, and I provide um, s strategic scientific insights, let's say. Uh, I provide funding, uh, God willing. Um, I provide exposure. I provide training on uh, writing and other uh, professional development um, opportunities. How do you deliver your onboarding material? I'm a big uh, believer in video and YouTube, and all of our welcome materials are online. Um, I gave a series of talks, uh, maybe three falls, three fall quarters ago um, on the, our mission, values, and strategy. I gave another one on, uh, on safety, um, and I gave another one on, uh, on sort of administrative onboarding aspects. And so when students come on board, they're asked to, to view those materials. It's almost like a video uh, lab manual and um, uh, and the that's been pretty successful. I probably need to update them uh, pretty soon. Uh, we have thought about a lab manual for a long time, but never never put it together. Um, but the videos are pretty good. Um, and what else? Oh, you had asked if the onboarding procedures were similar from uh, from new member to new member. Um, yes, they are similar. So uh, if it's a postdoc, we take them, usually I take them to breakfast or coffee. Then uh, they meet, they have a few one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with my current group members. They do a seminar followed by a lengthy Q&A. And then they uh, have some more meetings. They usually have a, uh, an exit kind of interview with me. And then my students take them to, uh, uh, to, to dinner. And that's when I think we learn a lot about 
candidates <laughs> um, uh, because they're no longer kind of on their best behavior, right? <laughs> and and when the when the when the the candidate's best behavior with me matches their best behavior with my students, it's it's a good sign. <laughs> Uh, and so we, we go from there, uh, usually, you know, some considerations of funding are, are taken care of and then, you know, it's a yay or nay decision. Um, grad students, there is a departmental process for recruiting graduate grad students. So they go into the, the graduate student pool in nano and chemical engineering where, where I am, we get about... 400 PhD candidates, we end up taking about maybe accepting about 25 and maybe 15 come. So it is a, a low probability event. Um, we get uh, the, the most successful candidates tend to be the ones who reach out to their to, to me ahead of time. Um, and definitely list me in their among their faculty interests, because if they uh, if they if they don't, I might not be assigned to their application. And then uh, once they're here, we structure it kind of the same way. Um, there are some mandatory events during the uh, during the recruitment weekend that they have to attend. Um, but other than that, I try to structure it as closely as possible as to what I describe for postdocs. The last cohort um, are undergraduates. Most undergraduates are not uh, recruited directly by me, but I get emails of interest from undergrads. And at the same time, I get emails or I get notification from my grad students and postdocs and even senior undergraduates that they're looking for assistance with their project and then i connect them to the most uh, promising uh, undergraduates have, who have sent me their resumes and then they um, arrange for uh, interviews and then decide who their top choices are i usually meet with the grad student or postdoc um, uh, or plural at the same time, figure out who's gonna be assigned to which which project, and uh, and that's how we do it. Do you use any electronic tools to control your workflow in the lab? Most of my direct communication with the lab comes through. Uh, group meetings. So at the end of group meeting, when everyone's done their roundtable, it comes around to me and I talk about any big issues that may, you know, be on the on the table or on the horizon. Uh, my group has recently started using Slack. I think the jury is still out as to whether or not that's going to be what we use um, going forward. Um, they seem to like it. They seem to check it. Uh, it didn't start with me because I don't need another app to check. <laughs> um, uh, I'm I I consider myself a fairly productive uh, person with fairly decent time management skills, and I do the one thing that you're never supposed to do is to use your email inbox as your to-do list, which I absolutely do. Uh, so Slack is is kind of a a, a garden path for me, but my students wanted to try it because otherwise they're just using Gchat and uh, Slack is certainly better than that for keeping uh, keeping track of, of purchasing and equipment, you know, being down and stuff like that. How often do you post to Slack versus your students posting? Through, through the Slack channel, it's usually coming through other lab, uh, lab members. Um, I would say that if I'm going to make an important an announcement to the group, um, I haven't really done that yet on Slack, except for kind of business related things like a candidate is visiting tomorrow or whatever. Um, but I'll usually use email for that.